How many of you are glad to be here? Amen. I'm glad to be here because, not because you are here alone, not because I'm here, but I can sense this, the presence of God even in this place. Amen. We may not see Him, but we know His Word says what? When two or three are gathered in His name, He's here in the midst of us. Amen? Amen. And I believe it even I may not see Him right now, but I can sense His presence. Hallelujah. Amen. But right now, I'm to turn the Word of God, and the Word of God that reminds us who Jesus is. Amen. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 6, the Bible reminds us that it would not be robbery for him if he was to say, I'm equal to God, <coughs> because he is God. Somebody say amen to that. But yet, the Word of God reminds us of a very important revelation. And this revelation, if you look at Philippians, tells us something more. And the Word of God says, but made himself. I want to hear this word. Made himself. It means that Jesus Christ chose to do something. <clears throat> what did he do? Although he was equal in every way to God, he made himself of no <coughs> reputation. Not only no reputation, he took upon himself the form of a servant. And not only took on the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Can you believe this? A God who so loved that He would just descend even to the level, of the level of His creation. And the Word of God reminds us for God so loved that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. And this is important. And the Word of God goes on here in verse 8 and saying, Being found in the fashion of men, he humbled himself. He actually lowered himself. He came not only to our level. The Word of God says, he humbled, he lowered himself and became obedient. You know, for to be obedient means there must be a reason why there had to be obedience. And here the Bible says, and what? When we can't even understand, obedient even unto death, even the death of the cross. Why? Why was there a need for the cross? Why was there a need for obedience? Well, the book of Romans, we are reminded by the disobedience of one man, the first created man, Adam. Sin came to the world. Sin. Sin is about separation from God. No longer we were, were we as men, the first man was created in the very likeness and after, in the image and after the very likeness of God. Separation came. Sin came. And when sin came, the Word of God reminds us sickness, disease. There was physical death, stress, issues, problems. There was spiritual death that we could not discern spiritual things. But there was also soulish death that our emotions, that not only our emotions, but our intellect all became impaired. Not only became impaired, therefore, consequentially, our very volition, the ability for us to make right choices was also impaired. And we see this. And tomorrow I'll be talking a bit about this destiny that God has given to humanity right from the first man. A humanity was given such a destiny to be the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. To be, and to have dominion even of all God's creation. But yet in that fall, there was relationship broken. There was separation from God. And consequently, there's somebody who now claims that because of this obedience of man, he can now declare himself to be the God of this world. And you know, even Scripture today in the New Testament still acknowledges that this, I always joke, as Satan, he's not a Chinaman. But as Satan still 
declares himself as the God of this world. And in this world, we know his very nature to kill, to steal, destroy. His very nature that he cannot help to do what he does. Wow. Because of this, we see the turmoil that's going on. But God in his love, even though the Bible says, after Adam's sin, we continue to reproduce in the line of Adam. And as we reproduce in the line of Adam, the Word of God says what? All of us have become sinners. All of us, without exception, have fallen short of the glory of God. Amen. I didn't understand that. I was a man of the world. I thought that because I went to law school, I was so smart. I thought that because I could do business that could make a lot of money, I thought I had it all. But how, let me tell you this. There was still that thief that came. And I was deluded and I was led like so many people into the ways of the world. I won't tell you this. In 1990, I got saved again. You know I use the word saved again? Saved. Saved for what? Saved to also be restored and to be obedient. Wow, I didn't understand that. Because the book of Romans says not only because of one man's disobedience. Sin came to the world. But because of one man's obedience, many can be made righteous today. The price has been paid. All that needs to be done by God has already been done. When Jesus hung upon the cross, when he shouted those words, it is finished. You know what happened? His disciples thought the whole dream is finished. They saw death of a man. They didn't understand the power of the death of one man. That death was not about just blood being shed. That death was about the obedience of one man. And that blood that was shed established a new covenant. A new covenant, a new testament from God. You know, as a lawyer, we understand what a last will and testament is all about. And God has a last will and a testament for all of His creation. Yes, because of the fall. The Bible says a curse came upon not only creation. A curse came even upon the devil. A curse came upon women. A curse came upon man. A curse came that we, even for man, that we would labour and labour and only eat through the sweat of a brow. Today I see so many people still labouring. Still labouring. You can make a lot of money, but you're still under labour. And a lot of people, they can't enjoy even the fruit of their labour, working no day, no night. You know, this is like the pattern in an urbanised society like Singapore. And I want to tell you, it's no difference. I've been into developing countries. In fact, next month, we are going back to Cambodia. Yeah. But I want to tell you that. That curse is everywhere today. But Jesus Christ, the Bible says, by His obedience, He hang on the cross. Not only did He break every curse. Yes, the Bible says, cursed is He that hangs upon the tree. And Jesus hung upon the tree. Not only this, the word says, there is no remission without the shedding of blood. The word remission is not forgiveness. The word remission is about what? A price to be paid. And Christ paid the price that you and I can be free from the curse that came upon all of humanity from the fall. But yet many of us are still walking under the curse. Many of us still don't understand that by the very testament, the new testament that God has given, that there are 7,487 promises right here in His Word of God. And every promise, I want you to hear this. The word in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 tells us 
if you are a believer, if you partake by accepting the finished work of Jesus Christ, that when He died on the cross, He did something more than pay the price for the curse to be broken. You see, in every will, there's three things. There's a testator. There are beneficiaries. And there is also the inheritance. Amen. But as a lawyer, I'll tell you this. This is true. And the author of Hebrews in chapter 9 actually picked this up. However, for a will, for the components of the will to come together to crystallize, the testator must die. God could not die. But God, in His love, took part of Himself, gave a son, gave a son, part of Himself, in the line of man, to become man, that He would die for man. Wow. Testator died. Will crystallize. Beneficiaries are there listed. Inheritance is waiting. Well, let me tell you something like any will. Sometimes people don't receive the inheritance even though they be beneficiaries because either they don't know, they get swindled. <laughs> you get the wrong administrator. Sometimes the inheritance gets stolen. And this is the problem. Many, many of us are believers of Jesus Christ, but we have not become partakers of the fullness of the inheritance. Do you know that I was born in a Christian family? My grandfather was a pastor. His younger brother was the first chaplain of prison. And we come from a whole line of pastors. But you know, I didn't realize something. There's no such thing as being born a Christian. Somebody say amen. You know, the Word of God actually tells us each of us need to make that personal commitment and decision. That encounter with God. How many know this? Many of us say, oh, but the Bible says, if you believe in God as one true God, if you believe in Jesus Christ who came and died for us, you are saved. Yes? No? Well, I ask often this question. Does the devil not know that God is the one true God? In fact, the Word of God reminds us, he trembles when he knows God is around. Does he not know Jesus Christ was a son sent by God? Yes, he did. In the great temptation, he actually tried to challenge that evil. Not that he didn't know it. He knew. But did he get saved? No. Salvation is for each and every one of us who can not only believe that Christ has come to die for us, but even more than that, you need to understand something. And the Word of God says, and confess Him as Lord. You know, the Lordship of Jesus Christ is what changes us, is what translated us out from the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of His marvellous light. I didn't understand that. I lived 40 years of my life. Oh, now you know my age. <laughs> 40 years of my life, believing I was saved, and yet, I became a man of the world. Drinking, smoking, gambling, partying. I didn't understand. I was past, past 40 years old when I began to encounter that nobody gets born as a Christian, the Word of God actually talks that you need to encounter God to be born again. I like the word born again. Born again. And that born again experience is not only the born again where you become spiritually alive, but there is two born again experiences. One is to be spiritual life. The other again is to be born again in our Soul. Yes, we may be accepting Jesus. We can see the spiritual thing. But how many know that we can't bring our body into subjection 
until James 1.21 says, you know, it took me a long time. I never saw that before. James chapter 1, verse 21 says, the salvation of your soul. Wow! I'm not going to talk about that today. Come tomorrow, we'll talk about this. How we need to enter the destiny. Many of us, we already have the destiny. But destiny always involves four things. One is a walk of faith. Faith requires you to know and to have a relationship with God. Without faith, you cannot please Him. True. But faith comes from hearing. And how would you hear if you do not have a relationship with God? Second thing is that you think you're going to work for your destiny. It took me a long time. I was working and striving and striving until I began to realize the covenant of God, and that's why I ended up calling this ministry Covenant Vision when in 1998 I entered the full-time ministry. Because it's a covenant of God that God Himself will fulfill the destiny He has for each and every one of us. Wow. I didn't understand that. And you know, there's something about destiny too. You see, when we are in the world, our attitude is gimme, 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 gimme. Right? No, I know I'm talking about some people down the road. <laughs> but it's true. We are still in a world and it's about I, me, and my. And I want you to hear this. A destiny that God has for you is not only to bless you, but to be a blessing. Somebody shout amen. And the fourth thing that's very important in our destiny is about choices you make. You make the choice today. Ephesians 3.20 says, Unto him, God, who is able to do, already done, exceedingly, abundantly, yes, even above all that you can ask or imagine. All. All means in Christ. That 7,487 promises is a yes and amen. I couldn't understand it. Yeah, it was in 206 that I was going blind and I trust God for the healing of my eye. And I tell you, doctors told me, if I don't have a quick operation, I'm going to go blind. I won't tell you this. Doctors are wrong. There's only one Dr. Jesus. Somebody shout amen. amen. In 208, I had a heart attack. Somebody heard the testimony. Not only did I found out that I had a block branch, not only did I found out that I had minor heart attacks before, they found that three block arteries, they could do angioplasty, and I was being scheduled for a triple bypass. I thank God for doctors who gave me such a graphic explanation of what a triple bypass involved, about veins being taken out of my leg. Oh my goodness. <laughs> How many know sometimes we got brought to a point of fear that we begin really to seek God? All I can tell you is this. Finally, long story. You know what doctor said to me? We have a problem. I have a problem. You know what's the problem? He said, all the earlier machines malfunction. <laughs> I'm serious. I should be joining a zippers club. He said, he's going to give me a zip here. I want to tell you this. No triple bypass. You're not excited. I'm getting excited with everything of it. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I tell people I'm a walking miracle because not of what I'm able to do, but because of what he has already done, what he has promised. And Ephesians 1 3 says, You are already blessed. It's already a yes and an amen in Jesus Christ. Amen. One amen here. <laughs> no, I'm serious. It changed my life. It began to make me understand that as he was obedient, I had to also be obedient. Paul talks about this. Not only price paid, but now you need to be partakers. You need to walk in the obedience. You need to walk in the newness of life. 
What does this newness of life entail? Well, I want to look at something. Do you know, let's take a day in the life of Jesus. First, we need to understand when Jesus was born, he was born as a total human being. He lived life as a little boy, like a typical Jewish boy. He grew up in the typical synagogue school. Yeah, you know, those days, before you can be to take your bar mitzvah to be a man, they will test you. You're tested on the scriptures. And you're expected to know your scriptures even. He went through all that. But I want to tell you something. He lived 30 years of life as a man. The Bible says there was no miracles, nothing. By the age of 30 years old, the Word of God tells us that Jesus was led. Where? To the river. There he was baptized. And there as he was baptized, the Holy Spirit came upon him. You see, prior to that, because of disobedience, our body is separated from God. But because of his obedience for 30 years, he was tempted in all ways, the Bible says. Tempted in all ways, like you and I are being tempted, but yet found without sin. Somebody say amen. And that was when the Holy Spirit could come upon him and indwelled him. And Acts 10, 38 begins to say how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, a man, with the Holy Spirit. And it was then that he was able to go around doing good. Amen? The goodness of God began to manifest in miracles, signs, and wonders. First miracle, very practical, turning water into wine. I, I thought it was going to be some big miracle of healing or something. It was something. God knows our needs right now in this world. Why are you working and laboring under the curse? It took me a long time to realize, you know, he spoke to me through miracles. If you learn to align, if you learn to be there, I will do the miracles. Amen. You know, it took me a long time to become a PAP. You're looking at me shocked. I'm not talking about the party here. I'm talking about the provisions, the abundance and the providence of God. That's waiting for you and for I who believes. Yes. As the Holy Spirit came on him. Look at his life. We would take Mark chapter 5. One day in his life. Walking along. Met a totally insane person. Totally deranged. This guy was, you know, they tried to bind him with iron. He was so strong, demotically. He just broke iron. He was living in the graveyards. He was running around naked. And he was charging and attacking people. And the demons did not want him to come to Jesus. But one day he saw Jesus, he went running. When he arrived in front of Jesus, what happened? All the demons started manifest. What are we doing here? Our time is not yet up. And they actually pleaded with Jesus, don't just cast me out, cast them out. And the Bible says there was something like 2,000 or more demonic spirits in that man. And when he cast them out, 2,000 swine got possessed instead and ran into the water. And that same man became delivered. You see, that's the anointing of the power of God. And I tell you this, I have gone through encounters like this. I won't go the whole story, but at one time I was so back sitting, I was sitting in temple committees and I was talking to the wrong spirits. I didn't say praise the Lord. <laughs> but I praise the Lord that I got saved in 1990. I encountered God in a very special way. Begin to understand who I am as a child of God today. Tell you this. Change. Look at his life. Not only after that, people got scared. Tell him, please leave, leave our, our country here. Don't want to go somewhere else. So he did. But the day was not yet over. And there was 
a ruler, ruler, the Bible says. Jairus. And Jairus had a problem. He had a daughter that was very sick. And so Jairus came and asked him, come, come, come with me to heal my daughter. Okay, he just said, I'll go with you. And there were multitudes of people around. You know, wherever Jesus went, the Bible says, there was multitudes. But you know, a lot of people had needs. But yet, their needs still remain. What is the key? Well, let's look at it. As Jesus walked along with Jairus, next thing we know, he encountered a woman with an issue of blood. You know, in those days, they are very religious and there are lots of certain rules and regulations. If you've got an issue of blood, you're as good as a leper, you're unclean. Do you know what it really means for a woman? She became unclean to everybody, even to her own husband, even to her own children, even to everybody around her. Because to come to contact with her would mean that they would con get contaminated. They would have to go through a ritual of, of sanctification. Nobody wanted to come near her. The Bible says she had been suffering this condition for 12 years. She had tried to go to all sorts of doctors, I believe. No more money. Weak. Alone. Nobody. An outcast. But all of a sudden, she probably heard about Jesus. What did she do? The Bible says she didn't wait for Jesus to come. She went. The Bible talks about her looking for Jesus. When he came to Jesus, there was that crowd of people. She could have said, okay, I came, I tried, I saw, I'm close enough, and now I go home. No, she didn't. Do you know one thing? She had tenacity. Her eyes was focused only on one thing. She believed that if she could but touch Jesus, touch Him, she could be healed. Do you know, that was what prompted me when we started the healing ministry with our first healing service on 24th April 1999. I want to tell you this. The Lord spoke to me clearly. I could not call it Francis Ku ministry. It was about touching Jesus. He is the one that heals. Amen. And since then, we have held, I don't know, countless healing services. Some of you know, we were in St. Andrew's Cathedral every month at one time, right? And we were going to different countries. We have held healing services right from India, in Africa, in Pakistan, in Myanmar, in Bangladesh. I won't tell you, in Cambodia. And I've seen the glory of God. And I'll give you the key in a minute. I've seen the main get healed. I've seen the blind see. I've seen the lame walk. We had testimonies. People who were dying got saved. We had miracles. I've got so many testimonies of how God had worked so powerfully. Cancer, when doctors said no more hope. How many know? Dr. Jesus says he can. But what's the difference? Why so many people and just one woman got healed? You see, she was single-minded. I'm going to touch. And the Bible says she went on her hands and knees into the crowd. I can see what happened. Probably some people would have stepped on her hands or, you know. And she couldn't let people know that she was having this issue of blood. Because she did, they would have kicked her, thrown her out, stoned her probably. But she had one single mind, touch. And the Bible says, the moment she touched, she was healed. Instantly. What did she touch? Did she touch Jesus as a man? No. She touched the power of God. The Holy Spirit anointing was upon Jesus. Although he was son of God, he was still a man on earth. Somebody say amen. It's about the anointing, the power of the Holy Spirit was there. And you know what Jesus said? He could even feel healing power. He turned to the disciples, who touched me? <laughs> and they were all saying, who? who? There's so many people around, who, who touched you? 
He said, no, this was not just somebody bumping into me. It's not just somebody pushing against me. He said something. I could feel power work. This was a touch of faith. Amen. And this woman, she was so afraid. Finally, she confessed and told about her need and how she was healed. And notice what Jesus said. He didn't say the power of God healed you. He said, it's your faith that made you whole. Amen. That day didn't end. It was normal for Jesus, a deliverance, healing. Then as they were going there, Jairus' daughter died. People came saying, oh, don't waste, some, waste his time now. Your daughter is dead. He said, no, she's only sleeping. Let's go. And ended the day with raising somebody from the dead. I tell you, it's a normal day. Deliverance. <laughs> Healing. Giving life to the dead. Wow. I've not raised anybody from the dead yet. I, I believe. I tried. I've gone to a mortuary in India to lay hands, but amen. But there are lessons to learn anyway. <laughs> well, praise God. I want to tell you this. I can only say something. You may say, Jesus died. He's no more here. What Jesus said, I must go that He, the Holy Spirit, can come. Do you know that if you're a believer today, you're born again, your body has become the temple of the Holy Spirit. And He that's in you is greater than He that's in the world. Amen? All that you need right now, the power to heal, the power for restoration, the power for reconciliation, the powerful provision. I want to tell you this. I've walked by faith since 1998. I never had to borrow. I never had to ask people for donations. I never had to ask people for pledges. I only realized, as I said, PAP. Only in Him alone I have my provisions. Only Him alone can I walk in the abundance of God. Only in, in Him alone, yes, in His providence, all things are ready a yes and an amen. Give God a clap offering. Amen. amen. And I want to tell you this. If you are a believer today, Jesus said this to his disciples. Before he ascended, he breathed upon them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. But yet he told them, But Terry, wait until you get in the Holy Spirit, come upon you. You see, I didn't understand this. There's one thing to be a believer, to have your body as a temple of the Holy Spirit, to have the Holy Spirit in you. But, you know, in John chapter 3, verse 3, he talks about this born again. To see the kingdom. But John chapter 3, verse 5, to Nicodemus, he said, marvel not. You need to not be born of water, but of the Holy Spirit to enter the kingdom. Do you know many of us are citizens of the kingdom? We are alive to see spiritual things, but yet we are not partakers of the promises yet. I don't want to preach too much tonight. I just hope I open your eyes and you can begin to see this. In John chapter 14, Jesus said something. If you believe in me, the works that I do, you will do also. But greater works even. I gave the key in Mark chapter 16. He said, go, do this. Deliverance, everything. But the word, the purpose of all this is not to meet needs. The purpose of all this is for people to understand that they can draw near to God and God is still able to do I'm quoting from Ephesians 3.20. Exceedingly, abundantly, even above all that you can ask and imagine. But notice, Scripture doesn't stop there. It says, according. According to what? The power that's working within you even right now. I want to tell you this. If you, have a believe, you are a believer, you have the Holy Spirit in you. Yes but for the Holy Spirit to come upon you. 
you have to do something. It's by your choice. It's your faith. It's about reaching out, touching God. Simple as that. You don't need me. I will join my faith to pray with you. Because the Word of God in Mark 16 says this. As they went about everywhere preaching the Word, the Lord worked with them. Amen? Confirming the Word with signs and wonders. I'm not the sign and wonder. I need healing. I'm another man. But the Holy Spirit is here. The Holy Spirit is ready to touch you. I've seen people of cancer get healed. I've seen all different things that the Lord has done, wondrous deeds in me. But let me tell you this. I'm still a man. I still need healing. I still need a relationship with God. I still need to spend time with God. Somebody say amen. amen. Tonight, whatever your need is, I'm not the answer. He is. Tonight, we want to give you an opportunity to touch Him. But before we do that, to pray for the sick and to pray for people with different needs, I've seen that healing services, God doesn't just heal it physically. I've seen even bankrupts who have been restored. I've seen finances released. But let me tell you this. God is still a practical person. He still uses the things of the natural to do a supernatural in the natural. Amen? Okay, some of you ask me, am I saying that I don't need doctors anymore? If God tells you to use doctors, use doctors. There's divine healing. But there's also natural healing. If you need finances, don't seek your provision. Seek the provider. Amen. And the provider is always there to give, but he's looking at the condition of your heart. Because as Satan is still waiting around, he's the spirit of mammon. He work to bring your heart instead of turning to God. Your heart will turn to what? To the things of the world. You see, it's all about not his provisions, not the abundance. His providence is there. But God is looking for us to turn to Him. God is looking us to come to Him. God is looking to us as a father looks to children. And He wants to be the father like many of us never had. Let's quieten our hearts. Let me ask the worship team to come back. Right now, I gave you the key. The key is not only knowing about God, knowing about Jesus. The key is when you make a commitment. A commitment to turn your life, to walk in obedience. To begin to embrace the Lordship of Jesus into your life. Some of you may be sitting in church for 20 years if you never really confess His Lordship of your life. Then after that, there's a journey of faith, I know. But I would give this opportunity right now. If you never, never really committed your life to Jesus, to say, Lord, I want you to be Lord of my life. Even right now, it's all heads about. Eyes are closed right now. This is a very important moment. I ask the rest to be patient. I ask this question again. Would you like Him to be leading you, guiding you, be the Lord of your life and for the Holy Spirit to come upon you? If that's your desire tonight, it begins with very simple. You make a decision, you just have to wave your hand. And I want to pray with you. Is anybody here? Anybody here right now? I see your hand there, sister. Anybody else here? I see your hand there. 
Amen. I see your hands here. I see your hand back there. Amen. I see your hands there. Hallelujah. Anybody else? Quickly, this is between you and God right now. Okay, I want to pray with those who have raised their hands. And even as they have raised their hands, I want to take you, ask you to take that step of faith to come out right here. Because I want to really lay hands and pray with you. Come right here right now. And if those of you have not raised your hands, but well, you say, God, I want to come. Yeah, free to come right now. Remember, this is between you and God. 